I am going to call our meeting uh, to order. Uh, we do have a quorum. And at this time, uh, would you like to rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, so uh, for those of you who are uh, joining us virtually, I have to tell you that I'm pretty excited that for the first time in months, uh, we actually have someone here for public comment. And uh, because she cares so much about the safety and health of all of us, of course she's here already with a mask on. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I am, I'm thrilled to see Dulcie Johnson across from me at an official uh, public uh, mm -hmm. lectern. And Dulcie, um, we're going to let you start, but if it looks like the, we, we, we practice this ahead of time. If it looks like it's not working, we'll take a moment and try to get that uh, started. So, the red lights are on. All right. Yeah. So, all right. So with okay. that, uh, I will <laughs> turn this over to Dulcie. Thank you. Okay. Dulcie Johnson, 1306 North 3rd Street, Sheboygan. Good afternoon. I listened with concern to the discussion last month of the interests of some staff and board members to write a policy supporting the intent of the Black Lives Matters movement. Our family lived in Minneapolis several years before moving to Sheboygan in 1965. I remember Minneapolis as a beautiful, peaceful city, and I was shocked by what happened to George Floyd, as well as the aftermath with protesters destroying parts of the city. The protesters obviously had a different agenda than protesting Floyd's murder, which was an unfortunate example of man's inhumanity to man. Granted, George Floyd had not led a perfect life, and what he did at the time of his death was not right. But his murder by a Minneapolis police officer was an unjustified and blatant abuse of power. Probably an act of revenge, as we later learned that they both worked as security bit persons at the same business. However, I do not think it is necessary or appropriate for the Mead Public Library Board to write a position policy on racial or social injustice. I believe the current and long-standing policies of the library already support inclusion. We welcome and serve everyone, as stated in Mead's mission, values, and goals. Further, in a legal opinion, authored by then attorney Steve McLean in 2014, I quote, as a general proposition, the library board is an arm of the city and not a distinct unit of government, end of quote. It would be more appropriate for the city council to address this issue with a resolution in support of racial and social justice for all citizens. The library is seen as a community hub and supports positive community conversations and civic engagement. It would be good and appropriate for the library to sponsor programs on racial and social injustice, but I do not believe it is necessary to amend Meade's mission or policy statements to comment on the issue. Absolutely, black lives matter. Actually, all lives matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dulcie. Um, at this time, uh, there is uh, no one else here in our chamber for the uh, public comments. So I will now turn it over to 1.4 on our agenda, uh, approval of the minutes. Uh, so in pulling up, I have to go back to the <laughs> too many devices right here. Uh, these are the minutes from uh, June 25th of 2020. 
And uh, I would just like to uh, share before looking for a motion that um, special thanks to uh, Nancy Manchin uh, with her detailed review of our uh, uh, minutes uh, that there are three small grammatical errors that in our uh, TO that is referenced in section 3.4. And I just wanted to uh, share that those grammatical errors of punctuation will be corrected in the table of organization. The errors are not featured actually in our minutes. But I just wanted to bring that to your attention. And thank you to Nancy for her uh, detailed review. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to approve our minutes from June 25th of 2020? This is Kyle, I so move. Okay. A second. And the second came from? Kathy. OK. All right, thank you. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any, aye. aye. any opposed? Aye. Oops. <laughs> any opposed? All right, uh, motion uh, carries. And. Uh, just wanted to also kind of share that uh, uh, the, the, uh, in the great attempt to try to uh, run this meeting smoothly, virtually, I really do appreciate how all of you are trying to keep your microphones muted. I know that it's really hard to remember to turn them back on and then turn them off, so I, I can already tell that you're already ready for this meeting in fine form because you're turning things on and off quickly. So thank you in advance for helping us keep this meeting uh, moving smoothly. Uh, at this time, I'm moving on to 1.5, uh, correspondence, announcements, and common council reports. I'm just looking over from very far away, the library director, Garrett Erickson, and there are none. Uh, so now I will move on to um, where it says 3.1 uh, of the 2021 operating budget. And I will turn that over to library director, Garrett Erickson. Oh. And of course, it would be nice if I turn it over if I actually turn on his microphone. Even though it is green, I have to make it red to make it go on. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Maeve. And I'll be real brief on the budget. Um, we were given uh, budget parameters this year very similar to in the past. We have a 2% increase for personnel costs and then also a freeze or a 0% increase on the non-personnel part of the budget. So that's frozen again. Um, and this, the, the operating budget, just for those that haven't been through it before, does not include the capital improvements piece, which has already been done for the year. So that, that piece is, uh, the project work is already done. So this is just more of our operating budget. So um, we had sent this out prior, and I guess there was some, some additional stipulations that Maeve had talked to me about uh, while we were putting it together. And thanks to Debbie for doing the work on budget. She does a great job. So Maeve, do you want to kind of comment on a few other parameters? Sure. Um, so I just wanted to um, make all of you aware that as we uh, talked about constructing this budget for this coming year, that um, if you look at the, the additionals uh, between 2020 and 2021, um, uh, the um, current uh, budget that we're proposing is increases um, a, uh, the budget by $96,000. And that is due to, in 2020, Me Public Library had to reduce uh, our board approved budget by 1%. Um, so uh, we did that because uh, we were told that that is what was happening <laughs> with all departments, only to find out that uh, all other city departments uh, did not uh, reduce it by 1% and they had a 2% uh, uh, increase. Uh, and this is in regards to just um, the, uh, the expenditures with salaries um, in regards to the budget. So uh, the budget that I'm having us consider today is um, with that increase of 96,000, which I believe we uh, should have had starting this year, and I'd like for our department to, uh, our entity to be uh, on the same level footing as the other departments in, in the city. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of, of that particular amount. And uh, 
in looking at the comments section, um, you know, with all the different line items, I think it's been it's quite helpful to have an understanding of why certain things are being suggested they, that they decrease and why certain things should be increased. With the caveat that there are some components of our budget that is still kind of unknown, because it is only uh, July, and those of us who have been on the board for <laughs> several years, we know that sometimes certain cost factors we don't find out until August or September, or October. So this is. But, uh, based on what we know at this time as far as what of our expenditures are. So um, I'm going to turn this back over to Garrett to see if there's any detail I've missed, but then I'm going to be taking uh, questions and comments from uh, all of the trustees. Yeah, Dave, the, about the only thing that I'll point out as far as the comments, Debbie, Debbie did a great job of uh, adding in comments, as you said, to each line item. Um, the only big change is really... Um, were from last month and we changed the TO a bit to have a couple of the, the, well actually the IT and the maintenance underneath the administration again. So some of the salary figures uh, changed again, of course, to, to change based on the TO changes. And so admin has a little bit more under the full-time salaries and, and those uh, other line items underneath that. And uh, then the support services be, would be pulled back uh, the same. So, I mean, that's probably the biggest change, but otherwise with a 2% uh, increase, and it's really just for personnel, there's not a lot we can do with the budget. And so uh, there's not a lot of changes. So I guess I'd open this up to questions, if there's any questions on any of the line items on why the certain amount was budgeted. Great. So at this time, I'm looking over at a computer screen to see if there's any of my board members that are waving a hand for a question or a comment. And then those of you who are joining us by phone and not by video, uh, you are welcome to just introduce yourself and say who you are and uh, uh, that you have a question or a comment. So I'm looking at all kinds of wonderful faces on a computer screen, and it does not look like anyone is, has their hand up for a question or a comment um, regarding the operating budget at this time. So I guess at this time, uh, I would be looking then for a motion to approve. Oh, I'm looking at my library. I, I would just add, um, when you do that, we, we do have continuing um, variables that are changing for us. So as the motion is made, if there was some sort of flexibility for us, um, in order to just make changes unless you want to call an emergency board meeting. And I know right now we're not scheduled to meet in August. So right. with that in mind. Okay. That's a, a May yes. question. Yes, go right ahead, Mary Lynn Donahue. Um, I, um, uh, so I guess my question is for Debbie, are, uh, are all departments at this, uh, I have not heard this, are all departments at this time voting on preliminary budgets? Yes, we actually have to have our budgets into Munis tomorrow, according to Marty. The only thing is, is they have not pulled in payroll, and I've asked Marty when that was going to happen. They were going to have a meeting last Monday, and I emailed them yesterday and said they still weren't pulled in, so he referred me to Vicki, and I've not heard back from Vicki. So... Once they pull those HR, the payroll in, then I can look at that against my budget like we did last year and see what kind of adjustments they pulled in. Um, you know, life insurance might be a little higher because the new rates just came out, but they should be very minor changes compared to what's on my budget. And, and I would say that this is, um, as long as we understand that this is an extremely preliminary document, um, the, I mean, there have been some, you know, general budget parameters that have been communicated, um, but how it plays out and what sources of income there are, I, I just don't want anyone to think that by approving this budget that we have a budget for 2021 because we just don't. Um, and I think it's fine. I, I was not, I was, I was, I, I did not know that every department had to have a budget into. Um, finance tomorrow. So that's, uh, that's my problem. Uh, and I think it's fine that we have a motion to, you know, to approve the budget. Just as I say, so everyone knows it's very, 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 very preliminary. 
Right. And, and, and also to Mary Lynn's comment, the levy has not come out yet, which won't be out till probably next month, which will play a huge part of the budget as well. So, well, so the, typically so, we don't we don't necessarily approve a levy until October, and we don't get our state uh, revenue um, projections until October. And um, you know the other weird thing in all of this is what amount of state CARES money, the money that the state is getting from CARES will go to municipalities and in what form and for what. Um, so, um, but, and, and, and I, I think it's, I mean, this is absolutely the, the thing to do just so come October folks don't say, what? I thought we approved the budget. So, 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 so this is, that um, mind, I'll move approval of the budget as proposed. I'll make the second tile. And, and for our public that might be listening, uh, the person that was answering most of Mary Lynn Donahue's questions was Debbie D'Amico. And so um, for those uh, people who are uh, calling in or whatever, if, if you could just announce who you are, because I, I, I did get feedback that sometimes they weren't aware when they were watching on TV who was speaking. So I just want to add that. So at this point, we have our preliminary budget. And to Mary Lynn's very good points, there are numerous things that are and uh, that will be changing over these next couple of months and this will not be our only time that we discuss uh, a budget and potentially then approve uh, you know a follow-up uh, revised budget uh, are there any other questions or comments um, in regards to this uh, budget and the motion that's before us um, this is Nancy uh, speaking is the word preliminary in the motion? Uh, just, so, so in thinking back to Mary Lynn's uh, motion, I believe the, the <laughs> I'm trying to remember the words that she just used. I should, uh, so. Sydney's listening. So. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, asking because I, I didn't hear it until Maeve commented on it, but right. I think that's going to be really important. Hopefully Sydney Main is online. The budget post. Um, I think that was um, a word. And Maeve, is it possible for you to turn your mic up? You're very quiet. Uh, oh. Everyone else is loud, but you're you're very very tough to hear right now. That's not good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, it, can you hear me more? Is this better? Yeah, it's better. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I really don't want to take off my mask because I've got Dulce sitting 20 yeah. feet away, and I need to keep her healthy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so okay. Thank you for that feedback. So just to clarify. I'm happy to I'm happy to clarify that my motion was for the approval of the preliminary budget as presented today. Okay, and so and Kyle, are you comfortable with that wording of her motion since you did the second? Okay. Any further discussion or questions? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, the, uh, the motion passes. Thank you very much. Um, moving on now uh, to 3.2, uh, the COVID-19 services responses. I am turning this over to Library Director Garrett Erickson. Thanks, Maeve. Um, there's several parts to this particular agenda item that I want to talk about in regards to service. Um, so the first one is, um, if I recall, the, the board gave me the latitude to make quick changes in between meetings uh, based on changing situations on the ground, so to speak. Um, and on Tuesday, uh, July 14th, the CDC came out with a, and issued a statement, you know, basically telling people to wear masks. And that is something that I've included that particular uh, announcement in uh, on uh, board docs. So that's one of the attachments on this particular agenda item. Um, it says CDC calls for Americans to wear masks to prevent COVID. Um, and so the library's management team was talking about this. And we also were looking at the local numbers 
and we saw that the local numbers at that time were starting to rise quite quickly. And then also recalling that the, the library board, I think Marcos brought up last time that he wanted to talk about uh, face coverings at the next board meeting. So with all those different things going on, we just, uh, and also in talking to Maeve, we decided to just go ahead and, and uh, make it a requirement here at the library. And we did start that this week on Monday. And it just so happens when we made our announcement uh, early last week, uh, it was shortly followed a couple days later by Walmart and several local retailers. And so the timing was good. So it just didn't look like the library was going out on its own. Um, and then also the city decided as well, uh, Todd, the new city administrator, decided to, to manage mandated in all city buildings. And so um, we did make that particular change. Um, so far, I would say 95% of the people coming through understand and are pretty good about it. So we have gone through quite a bit of PPE, uh, the face masks and stuff. And we do thank the Sheboygan mask makers for helping us with the, um, the washable type of uh, face covering. But, um, and then Maeve and I were talking today about whether this would be something, rather than just a uh, library administrative policy, that whether we wanted to back that up with uh, something, uh, a policy that the board would pass. And so I did include some language for our code of conduct. And you recall a few months ago, we had just looked at this code of conduct policy and put something in there about um, if we noticed someone was sick that we could ask them to leave. Um, now we had actually updated that and put some information in there about face coverings. And so when you click on that particular uh, attachment, you'll see that in the yellow highlighted area that, that new language. And actually, uh, Maeve and I had, Maeve had asked me earlier today to contact Chuck Adams and talk a little bit about um, his thoughts on whether the library board would want to, would need to pass something. And he said, if they did, um, he said, we probably should be addressing if someone has a medical condition, how we would want to handle that. And the options would be um, not serving them or asking them to uh, use some of our curbside service or we could put something in there about a doctor's notes. And so there's certain options that we have there, but that was not in the language that we have on board docs right now, but probably additional language that we should add to this if you guys vote to pass something. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Maeve, even though there's other pieces on this particular agenda item to go through. Right, so um, uh, Chuck Adams was uh, so helpful in quickly getting back uh, in regards to, you know, how our code of conduct can be, um, uh, you know, easily understood by the public and also uh, a helpful tool for our staff to be able to utilize in order to keep, uh, you know, everyone in the library safe. And he did suggest that, you know, the code of conduct uh, that component that is uh, yellow highlighted <laughs> uh, with the addition, and that addition says refusal to wear a face covering when required by the library and or displaying obvious signs of infectious disease during a pandemic or epidemic. He suggested doing some type of maybe like a little asterisk and then down below be able to say exemption uh, requiring a doctor's note so that it's just very clear and it gives clear guidance to our library staff that if someone says, oh, I don't have to because of my medical condition, then we have in our policy that, yes, we see that and we just need to see a doctor's note to, uh, to you know, uh, demonstrate that you are following our code of conduct. So uh, I just thought his suggestion was a good one. Uh, any thoughts on... Uh, this uh, addition to the code of conduct from any of my trustees. Just looking over at the, see if any has, anyone has a question or a comment. Um, Mary Lynn Donahue. So maybe what we're looking for then is a motion to approve the amended code of conduct. Uh, or is this just, just a recognition that, that this has been put into place at the library, right. Either of which is fine. I just wasn't clear. Okay. Um, I'm turning it over to Garrett Erickson. Yeah, he said we, we have an option. We can do this. He did think that Todd's um, 
uh, the, the city um, policy would cover us, um, and he did not think that the city was going to do an ordinance on it. So um, he said it was our option if we wanted to clarify this further, uh, further than what Todd Wolf did for the city buildings. So it was sort of up to the trustees. So any, uh, Dave, this is Meg. Yes, go ahead, Meg. I, I guess I have um, a couple of questions about the highlighted area, not because I am questioning its inclusion, but because I'm worried about um, putting the two of them together. Um, it, it might be important to have them be separate bullets um, because Wynn wouldn't want to have a doctor's note allow somebody with obvious signs of infection disease to enter the library, right? So that one would not be affected by the physician's note, right? Right. So yeah, we could separate right. that. Yep. And then my second comment, I get, and somewhat of a concern, is that if somebody does have a medical condition and we are asking them to disclose personal medical information to a staff member, I do worry a little bit about the implications of that with HIPAA and whether, I mean, obviously we wouldn't be storing that information, I would hope, um, but still asking somebody to disclose that would hmm. seem to require a certain level of training. Um, and I, I guess I am wondering if instead there would, instead of asking somebody to produce a doctor's note, we would simply say that we would work with that person to provide service outside of the library. Because if that person isn't wearing a mask and is, you know, has been exposed, we continue to expose other patrons and staff to that person. So um, I, I guess I'm just not sure how we do the face coverings without, you know, getting close with the doctor's note if we don't, if we're not doing something with HIPAA. That's really good point. Thank you, Meg. Um, so, Meg, I'll just say that uh, libraries have handled it different ways, and some libraries have requested doctor requests um, or doctor notes. Some have refused to work with them and, and would just sort of direct them towards curbside delivery or other methods of delivery of service. Um, so those are, those are all your, yeah, those are certainly options. So we're open. Um, this was sort of hot off the press when Chuck said we should probably, if we're going to do something, we should probably take on this issue. I mean, the other option is to just follow the city mandate as well and not to have anything in there. Okay. So. So, so, so this is uh, uh, where we are right now is that we, we, we have several options. One is, is that we can uh, not include this in our code of conduct and just follow the guidelines that have already been um, stipulated by our uh, city council for the uh, city-owned buildings. Uh, at the time of us having these conversations and trying to put this together, um, uh, we weren't uh, too sure if the city would take that step. So that's been a new development since we've had the conversation about the code of conduct. So one option is that we, we do not make an amendment to our code of conduct. A second option would be that um, we uh, leave the language in that uh, the way it is with no um, option for medical note. And then the third option that Meg had suggested is that we leave it in and just redirect in that they, we will provide library services um, you know, outside of the library as best we can. So um, just wondering if there are any other options or any other discussion points. Uh, Mary Lynn Donahue. So based on what I'm hearing, I think that this should just be a library policy that is not approved by the board. I don't think it has to be. And um, if there's board approval as an initial matter, then you can expect if you need to change it, there would need to be more board approval. And I think it's just unnecessary. I like the yellow language, the yellow highlighted language. Um, and I'm with Meg. I mean, when we start asking for a doctor's excuse, um, that starts, in my view, to get tricky. And I, I think we can just 
you know, leave it to staff. If, if we do get somebody who comes in and says, I can't wear a mask, you know, we can see what we can, you know, we, our, our staff is so skilled, you know, they can redirect or reservice or whatever. So um, my view is, is that um, I think maybe there should be a board vote that we approve uh, without feeling that there's a need to approve the policy we do support the change language if that's in fact what we do. So we could have a resolution or a, a motion that the sense of the board is uh, to approve the uh, yellow highlighted language with the understanding that uh, staff can make um, revisions as needed. Okay. So it, was that then a motion, Mary Lynn, or? or, or uh, I, will, I will so move. Okay. Uh, is there a second? And. I guess I'm confused on what, what motion is. Um, <laughs> so we're, we're, we're making a statement of support, but not amending the policy. Is that correct? Uh, if my thought, Kyle, was is that, um, first of all, given the fact that the city has instituted a policy without common council approval, um, I don't think it is a necessary predicate to have board approval. Um, but I think it would be nice if the minutes reflected that the board does support the changed language with the understanding that staff may change the policy over time uh, as needed. Okay. Okay. I, I think I'll make the, oh, I'm sorry, Kyle. Go ahead. I said I'll, I'll, I'll second the motion. And so, maybe I made it too complicated. I don't know. I mean, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is that we think the language is good, but it is a staff driven decision. So just, just to clarify, it's just my understanding that. Um, having a policy on code of conduct is something that the board has always had to uh, approve. And so, um, oh, okay. yeah. Uh, right. That's what I was going to say. We, we've always approved policies at the board level. Well, then I withdraw my motion. <laughs> um, so, uh, and, and I think that the challenge and one of the reasons why Garrett has brought this forward is that, um, you know, our policies that we create give guidance and direction and support to our employees at the library. And so I think there is uh, some thought that there might be um, some uh, response to not wanting to wear a mask and, and to be able to, uh, refer to the code of conduct of how we expect everyone's behaviors to be within our building. It made sense, I think, for the library staff that we would have you know, a line in here about not wearing a mask, a face mask. So, um, and so that's where I think that, uh, that's where this idea came from. And I think when Chuck Adams saw it, he was just like, well, if you're gonna put that in there, you do need to recognize that there are people that are, are going to feel that there needs to be exceptions. <laughs> so maybe the, the language that we put in is, you know, with any, with any you know, code of conduct, I guess uh, the public can have the conversation with <laughs> the library director, so. I, I, Maybe I guess what I would say is, you know, implementation of policy always comes down to staff. Um, and I'm, I'm personally comfortable with the language without Put any exception there there's um you know the, the cdc says that the only time face a cloth face covering shouldn't be applied is on a you know a child under the age of two um or individuals who are having difficulty breathing um but there are no medical conditions that have been specified in in any area that would preclude somebody from wearing a face covering outright um, so, if, you know, I, I, I don't want to invite the door to somebody who is trying to say um, who just doesn't like face masks and says, I, well, I just can't wear it because I'm you know, medically exempt or, or X, Y, Z. Um, you know, I, I would leave that to Garrett's discretion 
um, to determine if this is an individual who should be allowed in, in the building without a face cover. Okay. Any other uh, thoughts or questions? I mean, uh, Kathy Norman. Yeah, I liked what was in the yellow highlighting in the code of conduct. It, it leaves the, the proposed code of conduct that was attached to the agenda. It leaves room for discretion for the board, the, I'm sorry, the library staff to uh, enforce it as needed, but it just says that when medically necessary in a pandemic, the library has every right to require this. I think the broader, the better, but it shows that, you know, we really have, in addition to the city, adopted this. Is our own policy. So any other thoughts or questions? So at this time, um, would someone like to bring forth a motion to accept the revision of the code of conduct as uh, shared in the document, uh, spe specifically the, the yellow highlighted addition? I will make that motion. Okay been moved. Is there a second? Aye, all. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, any further discussion on the uh, revised code of conduct? So just a point of clarification, if we do accept the language, do we want that to be two separate bullet points as Meg has pointed out? I'm sorry, what was that, Garrett? I'm do we want to have to split that up a bit um, as Meg had pointed out when she made her comment? That uh, there's two different issues we're solving there. One is wearing the mask and one is if someone's sick. Do we want to have two separate bullet points? Is that the motion? Um, that's a good no. discussion point. <laughs> just one, just as is then? I was, I was suggesting uh, two separate bullet points when we were suggesting that a doctor's note might allow an exception to the first of the phrases. Okay. Um, but I, I support Kathy's reading that it, it becomes helpful to keep it broad, and if the doctor's note is off the table, I'm fine having it be a single bullet. Thank you, Meg. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Any further discussion? Can I ask a question? This is Sydney. Sure. Just for clarification on the motion, um, are we including that it, the proposed changes are with the understanding that staff can make changes as needed? Uh, no, uh, the, the motion was the code of conduct as written and shared by, uh, with the full board with the revision being just the yellow highlighted uh, component. Does that make sense, Sydney? Yes, thank you. Sure. There's been several options. It's hard to keep track of them all. <laughs> Especially when we're not all in the room and we can just hand each other the scribbled note. <laughs> so any other further discussion? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Okay, so let's continue with uh, some other discussion points on the COVID service responses. Um, another question that's come up is, and we've talked about this a couple of times in past meetings, but if the metrics for uh, COVID continue to go up or if they were to go down, um, when would we shift services? And I just, as we have been going through this whole process this spring, just I like hearing from the board for guidance on things. Um, so on the bullet point, I, or on this particular agenda item, I did attach a couple of other documents that I'm going to mention now. One is the Sheboygan County dashboard PDF, as well as the Sheboygan County restart, uh, safe restart. And so uh, these are documents, especially the, the dashboard is something we look at fairly regularly and um, for, I think the attachment that I put on there was from a little bit ago, but uh, right now they use sort of a stoplight type uh, red, green, and yellow lights. And several of the, or a couple of the uh, metrics are red right now, meaning the cases were increasing here in our county. And uh, 
some of the other things were in green and some were in yellow. And so I did reach out to the uh, local public health department and what they're really concerned about at this point is um, the care, uh, the care area, which is how much uh, capacity we have in the hospitals. And I think as of today, we have three people hospitalized. So we have quite a bit of capacity and that's what they're really looking at. Um, so if things started to trend backwards, staff were wondering, well, what would we do and what are we looking at in order to do something? So I wanted to run this by the board and, and get their thoughts. But since the health department is really keyed in on care, that's what I was sort of looking at as well. Um, the, right now it's at a green, but my thoughts were um, other libraries right now, I guess I looked at other libraries in the state, there's about what, 21 libraries that are over 40,000 in population, and 14 of those libraries are open like we are right now. There are three that are uh, ratcheted back just a little bit, and what they're doing is a, is a reservation system in order to use services. So if you want to get in to use the computers or to get into the book, uh, to check out books, you have to make a, you have to call them and uh, basically get a reservation to get in. I think that would be the next step in ratcheting down. And then um, if this care were to go to a red stage, my thought would be then we would go back to a curbside delivery system where we close the library. So I just wanted to open that up for your uh, comments on whether that would be appropriate or if you had other metrics that you think we should be looking at. And I recognize that all of you are probably utilizing you know, some of the same resources with the organizations or entities that you are part of, but uh, Garrett just wanted to make sure that he was not overlooking uh, another good resource in um, helping us make good decisions about the services that we can provide at the library. So any other thoughts on um, resources and metrics that he should be considering? Well, it, it, uh, Aaron, I like to, yep. I like the gating criteria from the safe restart plan. I think you're looking at the right measures. I, I can't think of anything else that, um, I would point to as the library should be monitoring as, um, whether or not we should reduce or increase services. Thanks, Kyle. Anyone else? I, uh, in, in light of the, the fact that um, uh, our next meeting is not scheduled until, until September, uh, and the, uh, the, the time period of uh, this contagious virus it seems to be moving rather rapidly in which nobody knows in which direction it's going to take. Um, I, uh, in speaking with uh, Garrett, I, I had asked, would it be of uh, benefit for him if our board um, passed a motion, essentially just giving him the uh, the authority, you know, to uh, quickly make a decision to close or limit library services due to the significant public health concerns regarding the COVID-19 contagious virus. And this is something that he would do, of course, in consultation in consultation with myself as the president of the board. But as you remember, not too long ago, that's, that's actually what we had to do <laughs> when quickly the numbers were uh, uh, moving faster than our perfectly timed uh, uh, board meetings. And so uh, does anyone have any thoughts about that? But I was just trying to provide the, the proper tools so that we can move quickly in case uh, that is truly needed. and. Uh, for this uh, uh, library. Oh, uh, Kathy. Um, I think you're still on mute, sorry. Thank you. So, EPI covers libraries, and I know the governor is not willing to do anything and take on the courts and the Supreme Court and everything again, but are we getting any guidance from DPI? Because to me, I would, as a library, I would look to them when it's time or when it's important to shut down. Um, I did reach out to Shannon Schultz at the DPI as well, and 
she sort of stated in her own way that they were sort of done with um, the guidance they had given what they, they could. Um, there is some new information coming out uh, that I believe Cheryl Nesman will talk about with some studies um, for how long materials should be uh, quarantined for, but they're not going to give us any more guidance on, on restarting or you know services and that sort of a thing. So I think we're sort of stuck that way as more of a local decision. All right, any other question or comment? So um, at, at anything else you would like to add? Um, you know, if, if the numbers were to go in a positive way, which it seems they're going negative right now, but if they were to go positive and the uh, local health department were to move us into phase three, then we would look at opening up more services. Perhaps we would look at meeting spaces and so on. But uh, at this point, it, I'm, I'm hesitant to say that we're going in that direction. I'm thinking that we would be, uh, we're stuck for a while or we could possibly slip back to phase one. But that's kind of my plan is to really look at those benchmarks and the, the care piece, just so you know what I'm looking at. And if it were to change colors, then we have some um, definite uh, plans in place to, to move backwards, so to speak. Okay. So uh, just this is Cheryl. Oh, I'm sorry, who was that? Sorry, this is Cheryl Nesman. Cheryl Nesman. Um, yep. Just to add to what Garrett was saying, something else we've been speaking about um, are our own levels of PPE here at the library and our ability to provide face masks to the public as well when we're requiring them. So that would be another metric that we are looking at. Thanks, Cheryl. Good point. Yes, I'm making the assumption we can get PPE and, and it's gotten tougher uh, to get it and sometimes it's being it's more expensive as well now. So mm -hmm. very good point. Yes. So uh, just to clarify, Garrett, would it uh, be helpful for me to propose that motion that I had shared, or do you have a different? I guess if, if there's consensus that that's the path I should be going down, um, I'm fine with that, just as long okay. as there's no uh, nothing that we're missing. So okay. those are the sorts of, anyway, the metrics that the management team are really looking at. All right. Wonderful, thank so, you. So, good. Um, and then the last thing I have on this particular agenda item is just the hours. Um, again, as I just mentioned in the county's uh, reopening plan, their county, what do they call it, Sheboygan County Safe Restart, um, we are in phase two right now. And in talking to staff, we think it's best if we remain at our current hours. And knowing that, and I guess another point uh, just for the board to talk about is if the hours and uh, uh, remain, or we're thinking we should leave the hours sort of in a status quo, even as we move into the fall, we realize now we're only uh, within two months of, to, of the next time that we change our hours. And normally we would go to all day open, or we get all day open Saturday and part of Sunday and later hours and so on. But we're thinking at this point, we would just sort of leave services as they are. And I guess I wanted to open that up for discussion as well, while we're in this phase two. Uh, um, basically the phase two is what the county's calling it. But anyways, mm -hmm. um, thoughts on that, I guess. Any uh, questions and thoughts about that? Okay, so it looks like uh, just making those decisions that uh, allow your library staff to continue to provide uh, services in a safe manner is paramount to the types, the actual number of hours that we can be open to the public. So what you've put in place seems to uh, reflect that nice balance between services and being able to offer them in a safe uh, way. So anything else under 3.2? Nothing under 3.2, thank you for the help. Yeah. So uh, moving on then to 3.3, .3, diversity statement. And so for this, uh, I just, well, we had the discussion at the last meeting uh, here at the board. And so several of us went back uh, and uh, worked with Josh. Josh did uh, some of the writing, or most, the majority of the writing on this. So as you can read from this short uh, social justice policy that's in there, 
Um, the second paragraph, he, I think we got the gist of it, which was the library board wanted us to be a vocal leader on equality and so on. And then we were already actively committing resources and programs to uh, racism and social inequities, but um, it's now stated that we should be a vocal leader. So I, I I guess I'll open this up to comments on whether we we got what the board wanted us to do. And uh, this is uh, Maeve Quinn. Um, it was, uh, I think, helpful to uh, have a copy of our 2020-2022 strategic plan where it really kind of reminds us that our mission is we connect people with ideas, resources, and technology to educate, entertain, and empower. And then the vision that we have is which is basically, you know, where are we headed? Uh, we aspire to create a vibrant, informed, and cohesive community. And, uh, and you know, uh, our strategic plan also kind of highlighted our various values, and one of them, of course, is inclusiveness, where we welcome and serve everyone. So uh, none of this of our strategic plan is changing. Uh, it's sort of my understanding that the social justice policy is sort of allowing our strategic plan to actually uh, have a little more um, direction, especially underneath the component of the you know, community hub. So uh, with that, uh, does anyone have any questions or uh, comments in regards to uh, the social justice policy? And I know a few of you are just kind of reviewing it too, which is always good. And, uh, um, you know, just trying to make sure. And, and for those of you who are uh, phoning in, I'm sorry I'm not able to see you sort of wave your hand, but if you would also like to uh, chime in with your thoughts, uh, please just go ahead and you can sort of introduce your name before speaking. Okay, uh, so at this time uh, with the um, social uh, uh, justice policy, would someone like to make a motion uh, to approve this uh, social justice policy? This is Kyle, I move. Okay, and is there a second? This is Marcos, I second. Okay, uh, any further discussion? I would just say I think it's a nice statement of, of you know our our belief as a as an institution and the role we play um, as as you know inequity to present itself in society um, and the steps that we take uh, to ensure that we have a inclusive and um, equitable environment. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Uh, Kathy Norman. Okay, so the so the policy as proposed talks about being a vocal leader and taking um, proactive measures to commit and commit resources. Is that something we're really prepared to do? I mean, it sounds nice and it's the right thing to do, but I'm I, I guess I'm questioning whether our library staff is already figuring out how they're going to put this into motion, or are we just enacting? empty words and hoping it guides us moving forward. Okay. Well, I think uh, when basically like commenting on social media was what was the catalyst for the discussion last time. That's a concrete action that we can take moving forward. I think we're already doing many of the things listed on the bullet points, which are uh, looking at um, so the service assessment we're, we're going to be doing and, and just collections, uh, programs, and so on. So we're doing some of these things, but we will you know, look at it again. Um, like I said, if you want to go through the, the DPI uh, inclusive services assessment, which is listed there, that's something actually the board uh, would want to do in one of our future meetings if this passes. Okay. This is, this is Cheryl Nesman again. Um, can I just add, and I'm sure Melissa would have had a lot more to say about this if she were here, but um, one of the reasons I think that the, the 
action items or the, the list of uh, items that we want to take action on were included in this statement or so that it wasn't just a um, it wasn't just a statement, something that we write and then forget. We wanted to put something in there so that we could take action on this and be accountable. All right, thank you. Great point. So Cheryl um, brings up a great point. So as Melissa had discussed with me after the fact, um, for Kathy's sake, we have an operating um, uh, an operations plan that works. It's based off of our strategic plan, and it's got a lot of uh, very minute details that we do from an operational standpoint for staff, and that's got uh, quite a few different things in it. And so um, that those are the types of things you might not see, Kathy, but we're actually doing. Okay. Any other question or comments? Okay, so at this time, the, 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 there's been a motion and it's been seconded. We've had a discussion. Just seeing if anyone else on the phone wants to chime in. All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, motion carries. Thank you. And now moving on to 3.4, uh, digital media policy. And so uh, Josh Lintier did put this one together. This mainly affects him as he's trying to figure out sometimes uh, how to comment as well as sometimes there's comments that we wonder whether we should block them out or what to do if someone posts a, a negative comment. So this is actually really helpful for him. He said, um, because you know, there's certain things that people can do or say that are their ideas. And, and as he said, uh, the policy helped him in the sense that if it's someone's idea, um, it's their opinion, really we need to be leaving those sorts of things up there. If it's something where they're slandering someone else, it's uh, obviously there's obscenities and those sorts of things, then he can take action on that particular comment. Um, but he said this already, after he had written it, it really helped him to make some decisions based on the comments. Obviously, social media is a two-way platform, and you're not always going to like everything you see, but that's the point of it is uh, we get good feedback. Um, and so Josh did uh, pull this again from several of the larger libraries like Chicago and Seattle and some others. So um, that's a little bit of the background on this particular item. So uh, this is Maeve Quinn, and uh, just wanted to, to share in reviewing the media policy. I, I felt it was very detailed and it was uh, very helpful uh, with how it was constructed so that I can follow through and recognize where there might be some concerns and how uh, we can still uh, you know, live up to the ideals of our mission, but yet have a digital media policy that is fair and equitable. So um, I thought it looked quite good. Any uh, questions or comments from uh, the board? Kyle Welton. Thank you, Maeve. Um, I do like the policy. I, I am a bit concerned on First Amendment grounds with this, and I'd be interested if, if this had been reviewed by the city attorney um, and just to see if there's any case law around this. It gets tricky. Uh, obviously, things like obscenity and child pornography. Well, obscenity is also, that's also tough. I mean, there's, there's clear... Um, cases on the Supreme Court uh, that are actually they're not clear, they're very difficult. Um, there's a famous, I don't know, that, I don't know, I can't define obscenity, but I know when I see it and that's not it. That was an actual <laughs> quote from a justice. Um, but uh, the saying things like we're going to delete or hide or remove content that's not related to library business programs, events, resources, materials. Well, I certainly understand that we are a public entity and we're the first amendment is incorporated against mm -hmm. the city and we're a branch of the city. Um, and so there's time, place and manner restrictions which are allowed, but I don't know, this kind of ventures us into a whole new area. And I guess I'm just concerned about the liability in that respect. Obviously, if there are things that are illegal, for example, child pornography, we have every ability to remove that. And, and that's against Facebook's um, user policy, but for things that are more general, like if somebody's posting stuff on our our posts that are promoting other things, 
while that's frustrating, I don't know if legally we have the ability to restrict that um, because it is it is speech. And I'm just curious if that's been reviewed or not. It hasn't been reviewed by Chuck Adams, and, and perhaps it should be. Um, we basically uh, used a bunch of the larger libraries out there and, and what they've put together. And so, as I said, it's been helpful in the sense that for Josh's sake to separate opinion from some of these other things that are very clear that they shouldn't be on there. And by the way, he doesn't ever, he's not supposed to delete anything. He actually can hide it, but that's, he can't delete it uh, for some sort of rule, I guess. But um, we certainly, Kyle, if you'd like, we could run it through Chuck Adams and bring it back next month. That'd be fine. Or I should say in September. Yeah, I would I would feel a little more comfortable with that. Again, I think it's a great policy. I just want to make sure that we're doing our due diligence in terms of what our you know, potential legal liability here, here is. Not necessarily that we're going to have, um, you know, a lawsuit brought against Mead Library, but you never know. It's a, it's a pretty litigious time. Um, and I think we just have to be careful because this, this is a rapidly evolving environment in social media and, and what are the intersections of um, – speech rights as well as, um, you know, reasonable restrictions on speech. Uh, so if we, if we just had, I think, Chuck's official opinion on it, um, it, it allows us to check that box before we put a vote. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense to me as well. And, uh, you know, just trying to figure out, as you said, this whole new world of just even having a social media platform, you know, you know because it's the Mead Public Library Facebook page, you know, everyone assumes that anything that's on that page has been sanctioned by the by all of us. And so I think, you know, trying to figure out how we can navigate that so that inappropriate, harmful spam, uh, other things that are, uh, you know, not viewed as a positive, uh, you know, how can that uh, be regulated? And if it's not, then, you know, what are, what are our steps? Because, uh, this was not something we ever even had to think about five, ten years ago. So um, I, I, is everyone sort of in agreement that we can just have the, our city attorney look this over and then we'll bring this back at our September meeting uh, with some clarification and, and understanding that we are not infringing upon uh, anyone's right to speech because the library is all about that <laughs> particular right so we would not want to uh, unintentionally uh, do otherwise. So uh, thank you for the discussion. Um, moving up then to the director's report, uh, update on services and programming. So Melissa Prentice is, wasn't able to be here today, so she did just uh, submit a written report, which is attached in board docs. Um, I won't go through the programs, but I will kind of touch on the last part, which is uh, we're excited to uh, welcome Santino Laster as the public sp safety specialist. He'll be starting on August 10th, and Santino is originally from Detroit, Michigan, and now lives in Sheboygan. He's lived here for about 17 years, and he has a wife and children here in Sheboygan. He's uh, been working down at Freighter Hospital as a security person there, and uh, he's going to be awesome. So we're very excited, and I think the staff is very excited to have uh, someone to help enforce rules again since Don uh, left in the spring. So that's uh, an exciting development for us. Well, that's, that's a wonderful update. And uh, uh, maybe uh, in, in the near future at one of our virtual meetings, perhaps he could join on just for a moment. Sure, sure. So we can meet them. Great. Yep. And the next part uh, from update is uh, Cheryl um, is going to go through the support services report. Sure. So um, as Garrett had mentioned earlier, we did get some additional um, guidance from. Uh, well, it was it, it came out of a couple of different organizations. Um, one of which was the. Uh, the uh, Institute of Museums and Libraries. Um, so the attachment is the Realm Test 2 report, and this was phase two testing of how long the COVID-19 virus is viable on returned library materials. In this testing, um, I guess the big takeaways were that uh, they recommend quarantining returned items for four days 
rather than the three that they initially recommended. Um, so we've started doing that. Uh, they also found that um, th they stopped testing materials after four days, but at the four day uh, benchmark, there were still, uh, they were still able to find live virus within uh, magazine pages. So on the insides of the magazines. Mm. So those obviously circulate a lot for us and pass quickly from person to person. They're not, you know, people read them quickly. So we did take magazines out of circulation. Um, and we have also prevented our patrons from requesting magazines from other libraries within the system. So that's kind of the big news there. Um, we're also putting the, well, I don't know, if anybody had questions before I move on? You can go right ahead. Uh, thank you for updating us on the dangers of magazines. I would have never thought I that. Right? <laughs> but well, I, but I, I, I am thrilled that you can still, with my wonderful library card, access quite a few magazines online. So uh, at least we have that backup plan. Right. I will add that um, we will be waiting for additional testing on those. If they give us an endpoint, you know, when the virus is not detectable, then we'll be able to adjust our quarantine and, and probably put them back into circulation, but probably not out to browse. They'll be kind of a little bit like the newspapers that we're not putting out for people to read in the library. So, 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 um, so Cheryl, Cheryl, this is Maeve again. So this means that utilizing the space of the Roca room is even more important for uh, all of our materials that are being returned because now they need to actually stay in that room for longer than the two days that we had originally planned. So it, the Roca room probably is not going to be utilized by the public until 2021 or even later. Um, so that's just good for us to know as far as what meeting spaces we're able to provide for the public. Sure, and just an update on that, we've actually moved our quarantine space down to the basement oh. in preparation of uh, the August vote. Thank you very much, and I'm sure our city clerk is thrilled with that, so thank you. Sure, and, and we did meet with the city clerk. Uh, the. Greg from maintenance uh, and Melissa and I met with the city clerk and we went through the Roca room. They are going to be making um, a few changes to how they are moving people through that space. So um, if you vote at the library and you're voting in person, <laughs> you can look forward to that. All right, uh, we are putting the finishing touches on our circulating book kit bag. This is new. Uh, in the past, people have been able to request our book kit, but they've had to call or email to do it. Um, we have put them in canvas bags. We're going to be putting them on top of the large print bookcases, which are uh, shorter bookcases on the first floor. And uh, people will be able to browse through those and check them out themselves. Well, that's we, wonderful. Oh, I just wanted to report. Oh, question? No, I just say that's wonderful. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> I just wanted to report that despite the call for us to open up the drive through book drops, uh, traffic has been very <laughs> slow through those. We're all really surprised. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, I think that is it for this portion of it. <laughs> so then uh, we're going to move on to 4.3, which is an update on building projects. Now, uh, the maintenance staff is now under administration, but I asked Greg, her, the uh, maintenance supervisor, to put together a list of the projects they were working on. He was more than happy because we only usually mention a couple of the things that they've been doing to you based on time, but he put together an extensive list, and so that's attached. Um, I am going to have Cheryl talk about one of the major projects going on, which is right next to her, and it affects her staff a lot. It's the materials return room. Cheryl, do you want to update us on that? Sure. So uh, we had a lot of movement on that one in the last few days. Uh, we were worried that we would still be a couple weeks out before we could even start testing how it works, but um, the contractor got it up and running. We actually had an electrician out who did some really neat um, 
tweaking to the system so that we can operate all of it from outside of the room that we're heating up to 140 plus degrees, which we're all really happy about. <laughs> Um, and we have been able to start testing of that room uh, today. So we're really excited about that. Um, initial tests, uh, it's taking a lot longer for us to get materials up to the, the temperature that we need to get them to um, in order to uh, cleanse the books. So we are going to be uh, working on different placement uh, of the materials in that room, um, looking at different sensors and, and uh, just trying to figure out the best, the most efficient way to do it, to work it into our workflows and to use the least amount of energy as well. Thanks, Cheryl. Um, so if you, if anyone's, uh, wants to get a little tour of that room, we can give, we can show them that when they're in the library next time. Um, a couple of the other projects I just wanted to point out to the board was, uh, third floor sneeze guard. So one of the reasons the third floor hasn't been opened up, one of the major reasons was because we didn't have the sneeze guards, um, or in other words, the plexiglass set up to protect the staff. And now the maintenance staff has gotten that project completed. So we're getting closer to opening opening up that third floor. We still intend to do that hopefully in the first half of August. So look for that to come pretty soon. Um, and then the other project I just wanted to mention is something upcoming. Um, there's been a little bit of some issues outside, right behind the generator, there is an open, kind of an open area. It's on concrete, but um, different things, activities going on there at night when we're closed mostly, but we would like to put a gate on that area. And so probably at one of the next few meetings, we'll be bringing a proposal. Well, we'll be to actually, now that the, some of the money's at the foundation, we might be going to the foundation and be getting a gift back from the foundation, I guess it would be, but we do need to probably close uh, one of those areas off and it'll be a little bit expensive to do that. But um, that's another project we're working on internally. So any questions on all the different projects going on um, from maintenance? Any questions or comments? Not all. It sounds good to me, so thank you. Okay. Yep. The, the guys, they got a lot of work done while we were closed. Lots of painting, lots of uh, maintenance, updating of uh, toilets and different things like that. Not the sexy kind of work, but it's really important stuff. So great job uh, by those guys. And thanks to Cheryl. She was supervising them through that time. Um, and then the last thing under the director's report is the monthly statistics, and they've been fairly consistent. We're still, you know, right around 50% is what we've had for a gate count, so compared to normal times. Um, any questions or comments on the statistics? No, the only, the only thing I just wanted to bring up is I, I found uh, out that... Um, you know, all of the numbers seem to reflect almost uh, the month before. And it's just, you know, very clear that, that this uh, contagious virus uh, has had an impact on our consistent uh, uh, level of, of citizens coming into the library as well as what they're choosing to uh, physically check out. Um, yeah. Although the, our, our digital checkout is still, you know, doing okay uh, overall it's it's uh i mean that's the only number that seems to be going up is our e-content right checkout. right yeah you know it just shows how much we were depending on people coming in for the programs so without the programs it's we've lost a lot of of what we do i mean the other thing is we've got very limited hours for working people right now I, I will have to say that I'm still just uh, so pleased with some of the creativity online uh, with some of the librarians, children's librarian, doing special videos and story hours and, uh, you know, just uh, ukulele lessons. I mean, there's uh, the, the creativity to try to provide uh, services from our citizens in a virtual <laughs> digital way has been uh, so impressive and continues to be. And I think it's really going to make a difference uh, uh, as this year continues. So uh, with that, any other questions or comments on uh, monthly statistics? Okay, uh, moving on then to our Monarch Library System and I can turn this over to Nancy Manchin with her update. Thank you, Maeve. Um, 
The uh, Monarch System welcomed its new system director, Kimberly Young. Oh. Um, she uh, began at the beginning of this week and sent an uh, email saying she had a wonderful first day. So everybody's <laughs> happy to have her on board and uh, wishing her well as um, she begins her, her work there. Um, also, uh, there's going to be a trustee training week, August 24th through 28th. That's a Monday through a Friday between 12 o'clock and 1 o'clock. Those will be webinars. And um, um, I thought I, I'll send that information on to Maeve and Garrett and share it with you. Mm -hmm. um, the re registration fee is covered, and there are several uh, really good topics. In fact, one of them is equity, diversity, inclusion, what library trustees need to know. And um, I'm, I'm planning to listen to that, and um, I think that I might be able to add something to that discussion based on our meeting um, today. A Monarch also approved a provisional budget uh, similar to the uh, the way we need to do that because we don't have all the information that uh, we need right now. And then in September, uh, Monarch will be sponsoring uh, a Get Your Library Card campaign. And it will include uh, billboards. Uh, right now, there will be one billboard in every county in, in Monarch that's been approved. Um, by the board, and I don't know if Jared's been approached, but um, the Monarch Board was going to ask the directors to see if they could support any more than one billboard out there. So I don't know if Jared's heard from them already or if, hmm. if that's still going, going to be, be um, um, asked. So that's what's going on um, in the Monarch system right now. and. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to to hear those. Any uh, questions or? Sydney, I ask... Sorry, this is Sydney. Yeah. Can you yeah. repeat the dates of those webinars? Oh, sure. The training weeks that you mentioned. Yes. Um, the the webinars are um, August twenty fourth through August 28th, that's a Monday through a Friday, and they are from noon until 1 p.m. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, when Nancy shares the uh, details with Garrett and I, uh, we will then send it out to the full board so that you're aware of the uh, opportunities for trustee uh, uh, training. Thank you. Maeve, if I could just follow up with Nancy, uh, two things. The new director, Kimberly, did stop by meet already yesterday and met uh, with the with okay. myself and the two ma two managers. So she was really prompt in in coming out to the libraries and meeting us. So that was great. And then also, as far as the billboards go, um, Josh Lintier did agree uh, to work with them on the billboard uh, campaign and and uh, use some of his marketing funds for that project. Fantastic. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Nancy, for your detailed report and your good news. It's so nice to get good news from, from, from uh, your Monarch meeting, so I appreciate that this month. Uh, moving on then to 5.2, Friends of uh, Mead Public Library. I'm turning it over to Sydney. The Friends actually did not meet this month. Um, they have very few actionable agenda items just because of all the cancellations. Um, in addition, they're, they're an, an older age ranged group and there was quite a bit of concern over meeting because they're meeting in a house. Um, so there was no meeting this month. Great. Well, thank you for that uh, clarification and, and I, I for one treasure all of them. So anything they can do to keep themselves healthy and safe, I'm in full support of. So. Uh, thank you. Um, with uh, And just thinking a little bit to what um, Cheryl had shared with us in regards to the ling lingering um, uh, a contagious virus on book materials, 
Um, I'm, I'm assuming that information has also been shared with our friends, because I think, I don't know at this point, are they accepting new materials? And if they are, you know, what protocols are we doing to keep them uh, safe? Because I'm so used to seeing their little Tupperware container, a Rubbermaid container by the door, that people could just drop things off, and, you know, that's not necessarily a, a safe thing for, uh, for anyone to do at this time. So. Wondering if Garrett or Cheryl would like to answer that question because it just popped into my mind. This is Cheryl. I, I know we shared with them um, about the three day quarantine. I am not sure they have even followed that, to tell you the truth. Um, we will share with them, though, the new recommendations. Uh, yeah, I think that would be wonderful if, if maybe. Um, if something written up could be shared with them, so it could be shared with all of their members, I would I would like them to know that this is new knowledge that we've learned, because uh, I really would not like for them to, you know, unintentionally uh, connect with a wonderful material that's been donated to them that that would uh, impact their their health. So thank you. Um, so with that, it looks like our next uh, meeting will not be until November 24th. And uh, that'll give me just enough time to forget everything I've learned about how to run this meeting up here <laughs> with my, I've got three computer screens plus my own <laughs> and buttons. So I'm gonna apologize ahead of time that I probably will not <laughs> make it run smoothly. But, uh, uh, but, but who knows, uh, maybe uh, the system will, uh, be just like a bicycle and I'll just come and uh, pick it up right where I left off. So our next meeting is on the 24th of September. I hope all of you continue to stay healthy and safe and uh, continue to uh, enjoy this uh, lovely uh, summer with uh, your family and friends. Uh, would someone like to make a motion to adjourn? The tile to move. All right, is there a second? Second, Kathy. All right, Kathy is seconded. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, any opposed? All righty, uh, motion is adjourned. Thank you so much and uh, have a good rest of the week. Thank you.